Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your continued protection and care for us as we begin a new day. We want to offer our, our lives to you, Lord, to be used as you see fit. Lord, we have plans and ambitions, not only for today, but for the coming weeks, months and years. But Lord, we know that our wisdom is foolishness. Therefore, Father, we want to filter all of our plans, all of our ideas through you, that they may be purified and sanctified, Lord. Be with us and guide our thoughts and our feelings this morning. May all that we do and say be to thy praise and thy honour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you know, this is um, a series of uh, morning devotions uh, with yourselves. Um, and I wanted to spend um, some time looking at the 2520. Whenever we look at any Bible subject, um, it, it's very difficult to isolate it and, and just deal with one issue because it, it, things are integrated in the Bible and uh, one subject touches another and another. Um, so as we go through this issue of 2520, um, I'm sure we'll be touching on many different subjects, uh, many different areas. Um, <clears throat> during these studies, there are four things that I'm going to be looking at. Um, when we look at any Bible subject, there are many ways of... of of discussing these issues, uh, many ways of um, showing the evidence from the Bible and spirit of prophecy that these things are so, and everybody has their own thoughts and their own ideas. So the things that I'll be sharing with you, they're not the standard way, they're not the way of understanding these things, um, but they're just the way that I see things. So I, I hope you'll get some benefit from them. So I'm going to be looking at four things um, with respect to the 2520. And it's, it's kind of like four proofs for the 2520. And more than that, it will I'll hopefully try and explain the importance and the relevance of the 2520. So the first thing, um, I'll just list the four things. I want to look at the, how the pioneers viewed the 2520, um, and this is post-1844. So I'm not really going to be discussing William Miller's view on the 2520 and how um, the 2520 was developed and discussed um, in the Millerite movement from 1840 to 1844. I'm going to be looking... Um, it's, not, how it, not so much how it was used, but what impact it had um, after 1844. Um, the second thing I want to look at, um, and it, it may not be in this order, um, is the charts. And that's the 1843 chart and the 1850 chart. If you're familiar with these two charts, you'll know that the 2520s on both charts but it's portrayed in a different way between the two charts. And I just wanted to explain um, the logic of, of what the 2520, how it's portrayed in both charts, and to show the integrity of the 2520 as it's portrayed in those charts. Um, the third thing I wanted to do was look at, um, and this is going to be a short <coughs> and simple, I stress that, because I'm not a theologian, this is going to be a short and simple word study on Leviticus 26. For those who are familiar with the 2520, you'll know that um, it's from Leviticus 26 where the main thrust for the 2520 is developed 
um, where this term seven times is used in Leviticus 26. This word seven times is used there. And there's great discussion within Adventism about <clears throat> whether it's correct or not to use this term seven times and use it as a time prophecy to get the 2520. So I just want to look at that and see if we can get any light um, on, that, on that thing. These are relatively short and simple um, areas of discussion. And the, the, the area that most people look at when they, when they discuss the 2520 is this fourth area um, to actually see through the Bible its usage. And what I mean by that is you're not going to find the 2520 you know, in a particular verse, but there are certain words that are used in the Bible that refer to the 2520 and you can develop this whole argument um, and logic to see what the 2520 is and how it's used through the Bible and also how our pioneers understood it. And, and what I mean by that is to see how it was used as a time prophecy. And we'll be looking at start dates, end dates, um, but hopefully more than that, we'll, I'll try and discuss what the 2520 is about and how it, how it is of relevance to us, what difference it makes to us, whether we accept it or not. So they're the four things that I want to look at. This one is obviously going to take a lot more time. Um, these ones are relatively straightforward and we should be able to do those in, in, a, in a relatively quick time. So the first thing I want to look at is, is this one here. I, I will stress that whenever you look at any Bible subject, even if you're looking at one that's simple, for instance, the Sabbath, you can go into a lot of detail and, or you can keep things relatively simple. And, and I'm going to hopefully try and keep things simple. I'm not going to go into too much depth. And we could use lots of different logics and different proofs for each of those things. But I'm just going to pick on one point and just offer it to you um, as, um, as, as, as one, kind, one type of evidence that um, for each of these things so that, so that we can just pick on one point. So I'm not going to labour on each point separate, on, on each point. So I want to take you to a passage in, from Spirit of Prophecy. It's found in First Selected Messages, page 207. And the title of this section is The Firm Foundation of Our Faith. As I read through this, I want to pick up some points because it has a lot of relevance to us today. Not just with regard to the 2520, but also how we view um, the Bible and spirit of prophecy and how we integrate those things or how they stand relative one to another because it's a, it's, it's a topical thing um, that's been going around for a long time in Adventism. How do we view spirit of prophecy? So I'll read the passage to you first and then we'll go back and, 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 and pick up some ideas. It says, Many of our people do not realise how firmly the foundation of our faith has been laid. My husband, Elder Joseph Bates, Father Pierce, Hiram Edson and others who were keen, noble and true were among those who, after the passing of the time in 1844, searched for the truth as for hidden treasure. I met with them and we studied and prayed earnestly. Often we remained together until late at night and sometimes through the entire night, praying for light and studying the word. Again and again these brethren came together to study the Bible in order that they might know its meaning and be prepared to teach it with power. When they came to the point in their study where they said, we can do nothing more, the Spirit of the Lord would come upon me and I would be taken off in vision and the clear explanation of the passages we had been studying would be given me with instruction as to how we were to labour and teach effectively. Thus light was given that helped us to understand the scriptures in regard to Christ, his mission and his priesthood. 
A line of truth extending from that time to the time when we shall enter the city of God was made plain to me, and I gave to others the instruction that the Lord had given me. During this whole time, I could not understand the reasoning of the brethren. My mind was locked, as it were, and I could not comprehend the meaning of the scriptures we were studying. This was one of the greatest sorrows of my life. I was in this condition of mind until all the principles of points of our faith were made clear to our minds in harmony with the word of God. The brethren knew that when not in vision, I could not understand these matters, and they accepted as, and they accepted as light direct from heaven the revelations given. For two or three years, my mind continued to be locked to an understanding of the scriptures in the course of our labours. My husband and I visited Father Andrews, who was suffering intensely with inflammatory rheumatism. We prayed for him. I laid my hands on his head and said, Father Andrews, the Lord Jesus make thee whole. He was healed instantly. He got up and walked, from, he walked about the room, praising God and saying, I never saw it on this wise before. Angels of God are in this room. The glory of the Lord was revealed. Light seemed to shine all through the house and an angel's hand was laid upon my head. From that time to this, I have been able to understand the word of God. What influence, what influence it would lead men at this stage of our history to work in an underhanded, powerful way to tear down the foundation of our faith, the foundation that was laid at the beginning of our work by prayerful study of the word and by revelation. Upon this foundation we have been building for the past 50 years. Do you wonder that when I see the beginning of a work that would remove some of the pillars of our faith, I have something to say? I must obey the command, meet it. I must bear the messages of warning that God gives me to bear and then leave with the Lord the results. I must present the matter as it is, sorry, in all its bearings, for the people of God must not be despoiled. We are God's commanding people. God, God's commandment keeping people for the past 50 years every phase of heresy was, has been brought to bear upon us to be cloud our minds regarding the teaching of the word especially concerning the ministration of Christ in the sanct heavenly sanctuary and the message of heaven for these last days as given by the angels of the 14th chapter of Revelation messages of every order and kind have been urged upon Seventh-day Adventists to take the place of the truth which point by point has been sought out by prayerful study and testified by the miracle working power of the Lord. But the way marks which have been made, which have made us what we are, are to be preserved, and they will be preserved as God has signified through his word and the testimony of his spirit. He calls upon us to hold firmly with the grip of faith to the fundamental principles that are based upon unquestionable authority. Are these the erasers? So there are many things that Ellen White deals in that section. But I want to go back through that and pick out some points um, and develop a line of logic, primarily in reference to the 2520. <clears throat> but before I do that, I just want to discuss with yourselves, just, just in a brief fashion, um, this issue or this struggle, if I can put it that way, between the Bible and spirit of prophecy. You'll all be familiar that um, in 2009, quarter one, for the Sabbath school, that there was the whole theme of, of that quarter was dealing with um, the Lord's prophets and the prophetic word and how we are to relate to the prophets that the Lord has sent to his people. <coughs> and one of the recurring themes that was brought about in this quarter was how do we deal with prophets that are in the Bible and prophets who are not in the Bible.
And in this discussion, if you if you if you familiar with with that first with with, with this quarter's studies, the thirteen lessons that uh, were discussed. And if you didn't, you can go online and and go and review this material. But one of the themes that was brought about, um, and it was a repeated theme, as, I, as I've just said, is this issue here about prophets that are not in the Bible and um, what their authority was. And you can use different terms. Um, you can either say over the Bible. So what is their authority over the Bible? Do they have an authority of the, over the Bible? And you can, word, you, you can sort of phrase this sentence in a, diff, in a number of different ways, um, depending upon what the point you, you were trying to make. But the theme that, that, that was brought about is how do you reconcile these two things together? Um, and from my reading of the point that the author uh, of, the, of, the, of the Sabbath School Quarterly was trying to make was that Ellen White, in her prophetic role, is not an authority over the Bible. And there were, there were a number of um, arguments, a number of discussions that were brought to bear to, 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 to prove this point. If you discuss this issue with theologians, um, they, would probably dis they would probably say it like this, that our authority is the Bible, and anything that Ellen White says um, is kind of like a helping hand. And we have to be able to show everything from the Bible, and the Bible only, and we can't prove any of our doctrines, um, any of our theology, using the spirit of prophecy. We have to use the Bible and the Bible only. And, through, and in that quarter, um, some of the lessons that went through picked out spirit of prophecy quotes that, that backed up this idea. Um, certain anecdotal situations were discussed um, that showed this to be the case. But what I want to point out is I'm just going to pick out some points from the passage that we just, we just read it from First Selected Messages and show you why looking at it from this perspective is actually inaccurate and, 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 it, and it's not correct. Um, and I just want to use this term. It, it, it's, 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 a, it's a secular term and it's called reverse engineering. There are other terms that, 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 that you can use to, to do that. Um, a, a good example of that, not a specific example, that many engineers, when they come up with you know, new ideas on engineering, they get their inspiration a lot of the time from nature. So you know, they will take an insect um, or a plant and they would look at its structure, its mechanism, the way it operates, um, and they would pick out those points and they would design a mechanical, um, some mechanical item which was based upon um, this thing that they found in nature. Um, and if you look at the item itself, you think, that was some marvellous piece of engineering. I wonder how they figured that out. And it would at first appear that it was just a matter of inspiration that they got it. But what they actually got was they got the information from a pre-existing source. So with, with their idea, let me, just, let me just read something to you. And this is, this is the point that the way this quarterly was, um, was, was geared up and the way most of us are educated to think is that we have to be able to prove everything from the Bible without using spirit of prophecy. And I'm just, just going to show you the, the, the fallacy of, 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 that, of that line of logic. So I'm just going to cut into the passage, and it says, Often we remain together until late at night, and sometimes through the entire night, praying for light and studying the word. Again and again these brethren came together to study the Bible in order that they might know its meaning and be prepared to teach it with power. 
So this is the important point. He says, when they came to a point in their study where they said, we can do nothing more, the Spirit of the Lord would come upon me, I'd be taken off in vision, and a clear explanation of the passages we had been studying would be given me, with instructions on how, to, how we were to labour and teach effectively. Thus light was given that helped us to understand the scriptures in regard to Christ, his mission and his priesthood. And then she, then she goes on. There's just one other point. She says, at this time, my mind was locked, as it were, and I could not comprehend the meaning of the scriptures we were studying. So you can see, post-1844, when we were developing our doctrines um, and establishing ourselves as a people, the brethren would get together and they would study the Bible. So they would look at topics from the Bible and they'd get to a point where they could go no further. And what would happen would be that Ellen White would uh, go off into vision and be shown an explanation of those passages. So we can see from this passage very simply <clears throat> that the foundation of our faith as a people was not established solely upon the Bible, because there were passages in the Bible that were unexplainable. They didn't understand what, they, what those passages were, were, were saying. So we needed the spirit of prophecy to help interpret those passages in the Bible. And this is where it gets complicated or it, it, things aren't as straightforward about Ellen White's role for us, for, for God's people at the beginning of, of um, our foundation and, and how we should use her today. For sure, the Bible and the Bible only is where we can find all of our information and our doctrines and we should be able to prove everything that we believe from the Bible a, a, on its own. But the problem is when we were established as a people, we didn't use the Bible on its own in this sense that there were many passages in the Bible that God's people the pioneers didn't understand and they required the spirit of prophecy to interpret those passages so they wouldn't make any mistakes. And so when we talk about is Ellen White an authority over the Bible, it's, depending on your perspective, it's kind of a bit, a bit of um, a, a leading question and it's not really a fair question to ask. As an example, <clears throat> a, a simple one, I was speaking to um, a, a, a pastor a few, uh, maybe over a year ago. And if you're familiar that in Matthew and John, <coughs> you have two accounts of Christ um, cleaning the temple. If you go to Desire of Ages, Ellen White will tell you clearly that those two passages are separate events and Christ cleaned the uh, sanctuary, the temple, um, at the beginning of his ministry and once at the end of his ministry. So she tells you that these are two separate events. Now, there are many theologians, um, and this pastor was defending this point quite, vi quite vigorously, and he's under the opinion that these two are the same event. Now, we all know that if you take the four Gospels, there are some features in the Gospels which are not chronological things are out of sequence, relative, one relative to another. And he's of the certain opinion that one of these Gospels is out of sequence with the other, and these are the same events, so there's only one cleansing. So he's suggesting there's only one cleansing. And the problem is, is, is one of these Gospels is out of sequence, and that's how he's resolved this issue, and that's how he understands it. <clears throat> so when he approaches this problem, his viewpoint is to look at the word only, the Bible only, don't look at any, any prophet outside of the Bible and make a conclusion um, from the words that he sees there without any additional help. So he'll use reason and logic to, to prove his point. There is a different way of looking at this thing. You can either say, for sure, it seems to me when I read the Bible that this is only talking about one cl cleansing. But when you read Desire of Ages, Ellen White makes it absolutely clear that they were two separate cleansings. So is she an authority over the Bible? It's, it's, it's not as straightforward a question as sometimes we, we, we might make it appear. Is she an authority to say that, the, if she suggests that these are two separate events, do we say, thus saith the Lord, these are two separate events, and our 
under, our, our understanding, our wisdom um, is faulty and we should just accept her and, and move on and, and, and remodel our logic to be in line with what she says. And it's a great, it's a great contention in the church today about what is Ellen White's role for God's people today? How do we use her writings to establish anything that we do in life? Our, uh, the way we operate as a family, the way church should run. And it's all based upon, because she's not in the Bible, is she an authority over the Bible? And I hope you can see simply from this passage that when, we, when, the, fir when the church first began in, post, in the post-1844 period, when we were developing um, the foundations of, of, of what we believe as a church, that without the help of spirit of prophecy, we would never got to where we are today. And if you're familiar with the history of that time period, you know that um, from the Millerite movement, there were many offshoots that came from that. And um, a number of the smaller churches that are in the world today um, uh, have, can show their heritage from that time period. Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, Church of God. There are a number of people. And the difference between them and us is that post-1844, when they had to deal with the disappointment and they went back to the Word of God to understand who, and who they were, they didn't have the helping hand or the guidance of Spirit of Prophecy to make sure that they wouldn't make a mistake and, and go into error. And we're the only people who, coming out of that experience, had this help, and that's why we are who we are today, that the, 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 um, the doctrines that we hold, um, the ideas that we have on, on the Bible are, are all firm and sound. It's purely based upon the help that Spirit Prophecy has given us. And this idea of reverse engineering is, is, is an interesting one. If, you're, if you've been an Adventist for any length of time, even if you don't read Spirit of Prophecy, the problem that you're faced with, that you're faced with is this, that the church teaches thoughts and ideas, principles, that if you didn't have spirit of prophecy to begin with, would be very hard to find in the Bible. For instance, we know from Revelation 13 that there's going to be a Sunday law at the end of the world. And if you go to an evangelistic series, they develop a whole line of argument using history, logic, um, thoughts and ideas. You know, the standard idea is about um, you have the mark of the beast, and then you, they, they compare that to the seal of God. And you go to Exodus chapter 20, where you have the Ten Commandments and the Fourth Commandment, and they develop this idea that this is the seal of God. And then they say, well, if this is the seal of God, this is a mark of his authority, then what must be the mark of the beast? And we explain who the beast is. So we deal with this whole line of argument, which is straight from the Bible, to prove that there's going to be a Sunday law at the end of the world. And nobody argues or quibbles with that. But if you, if you were to take you know, a, an honest-hearted Christian who had no access to this information and you asked them to explain Revelation 13, there is hardly anybody in the world who would say their interpretation or their reading of, this, of these passages, of this understanding, would develop an idea that there's going to be a Sunday law in the world. And it's only because we know through spirit of prophecy that, that all this is true what we've done is we, we already know, it's, in essence, we already know the answers from God and we go back into the Bible to confirm those answers and to prove them that, they, that they're correct. And it's this idea of reverse engineering. And I think as a people, we're dishonest to ourselves. And this isn't, this isn't, this isn't anything to do with um, how we relate to people outside of the church and, and how we introduce them to Alan White. I'm not discussing any of those issues. But I think to ourselves as a people, we're intellectually dishonest to say that we are people of the Bible and the Bible only, that spirit of prophecy is kind of some kind of additional thing which we can dip into as and when we choose. Um, because, and it's not, only, it's not only the Sunday, there are many doctrines that we hold that the majority of Christendom out there don't hold to. And the reason why we hold to them is because we have a culture and um, a background 
where we, where we have used spirit of prophecy um, as an authority and then we've gone back into the Bible to prove those things to be true. What I want to do in our next worship is to go back into this passage um, from First Selected Messages and to pick out some more thoughts and ideas from here and to, de- again, develop this, the, this, this logic to show that the 2520 does, in fact, have integrity and is relevant to God's people today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your continued tender care and mercy. Lord, there are many people in your church today who struggle with the role of your prophet, Ellen White, in their devotional lives, theologically, and even in their personal lives, Father, how they should order their lives But Father, there are many other people in your church who accept Helen White and they regard her, Lord, as a prophet of God and they claim to accept her to be an authority over their lives. But unfortunately, Father, many of those people in that group only go a certain distance. They pick and choose what portions of her writings they like. And those that they don't like, they just sweep under the carpet. Lord, help each of us to examine our hearts this morning and to see how we relate to her writings. And not only her writings, Father, but how we relate to the Bible. You are calling out a people from this world, Lord, who are prepared to stand holy, on your side. This calls for great sacrifice. Lord, we are living in the Day of Atonement where we are required, each of us, to examine ourselves and not to examine other people. May we begin to take hold upon your word, to examine it, Father, and to compare our lives to the standard that you have set before us. May we not be afraid, Lord, to shed those things which you have told us to leave behind. Be with us now and bless us for the rest of this day, we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your continued tender cares toward your children. Lord, frail though we are, you still have compassion upon us, Lord, and love us, despite all that we do and say that is contrary to your will. Father, help us to learn the lessons that we need to learn in our individual experiences so that we may set our feet in the right path, that we might not only be guided by your Holy Spirit for ourselves, but we may be workers for you, helping those around us, Lord, and directing them in the direction that they should be going. Guide our thoughts and our feelings this day, Lord. May all that we do be to thy praise and thy glory and thy honour. Bless us now as we come to open your word. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. <coughs> so we're continuing our theme, um, discussing the 2520 that we began yesterday. And if you recall, we... concentrated yesterday on a passage that's found in First Selected Messages, page 206 to 208. 
And in that passage, Ellen White talks about the experience of the, of the brethren after 1844 and how they came together to establish the, the truths that were presented in the time period from 1840 to 1844. I just want to read some passages <coughs> that will help us to solidify this idea. Um, and you, you'll get, there are two words that come up recurringly in, in these passages. And it's the word foundation and pillars or pins. And as I read these sections, what you'll see is that she uses these words almost interchangeably, but there, but there is a kind of a, a structure and order to it. What she describes is that the truths that were presented before 1844, the truths that are on the 1843 chart, are the foundation of our faith. And then what she goes ahead and says is that all the individual pieces of information, all the individual truths are the pins and the pillars and it's the interlocking of those truths that form this foundation. So there's a foundation which contains all of these pins and pillars and the individual truths are these pins and pillars as she, she describes them and she goes on to say <clears throat> that if we try to take away individual truths, individual pins or pillars, it begins to make this foundation unstable and it essentially would destroy this foundation. And the point she tries to make is that we're not allowed to go in and meddle with individual truths, individual things that are on this foundation. It's like a package deal, really. Almost similar to our concept of the Ten Commandments. You have to keep all ten, and if you fail in one, you fail in all of them. A very similar concept. So I'll just read a few passages to just establish what, what I've just said here. B before I do that, the reason why I'm, I'm showing you this, and, and the point that's being made is, in this passage from Selected Messages that, we, that we've already read, <coughs> and we'll refer back to, what's being established here is that the brethren are going back to the foundation, back to the pins and pillars, and going to establish and making sure that they were all correct. So this first passage is taken from Gospel Workers, page 306 to 307. The enemy is seeking to divert the minds of our brethren and sisters from the work of preparing a people to stand in these last days. His sophistries are designed to lead minds away from the perils and duties of the hour. The estimate, they estimate as of little value the light that Christ came from heaven to give to John for his people. They teach that the scenes just before us are not of sufficient importance to receive special attention. They make of no effect the truth of heaven, of heavenly origin, and rob the people of God of their past experience, giving them instead of false science. Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way and walk therein. Let none seek to tear away the foundations of our faith, the foundations that were laid at the beginning of our work. And you'll see when she uses this term, the beginning of my work, she's not referring to the time period after 1844. She's, she's referring to the period before 1844. In, in her mind, when she looks at us as a people, she doesn't have a you know, a demarcation is sometimes we may that we have the Millerites and then the Seventh-day Adventist church. She sees it as, a, as just a continuum from one phase to another. Upon these foundations we have been building for more than 50 years. Men may suppose that they have found a new way that they can lay a stronger foundation than that which has been laid, but this is a great deception. Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid. In the past, Many have undertaken to build a new faith to establish new principles, but how long did their building stand? 
it soon fell, for it was not founded upon the rock. <clears throat> A second passage that I want to just bring to your attention now is found from Second Selected Messages, 389 to 390. Here she says, after the passing of the time, and that passing of the time is 1844, so she's talking about a time period post-1844, which is the time period that first selected messages, 206 to 208, was dealing with. After the passing of the time, God entrusted to his faithful followers the precious principles of present truth. These principles were not given to those who had no part in the giving of the first and second angel's messages. They were given to the workers who had had a part in the cause from the beginning. Those who pass through these experiences are to be as firm as a rock to the principles that have made us Seventh-day Adventists. They are to be workers together with God, binding up the testimony and sealing the law among his disciples. Those who took part in the establishment of our work upon a foundation of Bible truth those who know the way marks that have pointed out the right path are to be regarded as workers of the highest value. They can speak from personal experience regarding the truths entrusted to them. These men are not to permit their faith to be changed to infidelity. They are not to permit the banner of the third angel to be taken from their hands. They are to hold the beginning of their confidence firm unto the end. The Lord has declared that the history of the past shall be rehearsed as we enter upon the closing works. Every truth that he has given for these last days is to be proclaimed to the world. Every pillar that he has established is to be strengthened. We cannot now step off the foundation that God has established. We cannot now enter into an, any new organisation, for this would mean apostasy from the truth. <clears throat> there are a couple of things that she deals with in this passage. She speaks about the people who were first doing the work pre-1844, are the very ones who are to continue with this work and are the ones who established the principles that were on the 1843 chart. And we read that in First Selected Messages. She names a number of people and all those people were involved in the work beforehand. And then she says, um, an interesting passage portion right at the end, she says, we cannot now enter into any new organisation. This would mean apostasy from the truth. Here she's making a, a reference that there are many people now who, when they're challenged by Christians in, in the w outside of our church, um, they try to uh, distance themselves from the Millerite movement. Um, and any mistakes that the Millerites made, um, they would say, well, well, they were Millerites and you know, they've made mistakes, but we're Seventh-day Adventists. And we, we try and have this distance between ourselves. But, but here she says that there is no difference. The Millerite movement and the Seventh-day Adventist church are one, one continuum. And she says, if we don't follow on and accept the foundation, the truths that were established between 1840 and 1844, then we would enter into a new organisation. And by that, she means that we would no longer be Seventh-day Adventists. <clears throat> First manuscript releases, page 55. She says, not a pin is to be moved from the foundations of our faith. Truth is still truth. Those who become uncertain will drift into erroneous theories and will finally find themselves infidel in regard to the past evidence we have had of what is truth. The old way marks must be preserved lest we lose not our bearings. Sorry, that we lose not our bearings. Review and Herald, April 14th, 1904. Interestingly, you'll find that many of these passages um, are taken quite a ways into our experience, that they're not, they're not statements that she made early on in our experience. <clears throat> the warning has come, nothing is to be allowed to come in that will disturb the foundation of the faith upon which we have built, been building ever since the message came in 1842, 1843 and 1844. I was in this message and have ever 
And ever since I have been standing before the world, true to the light that God has given us, we do not propose to take our feet off the platform on which they were placed as day by day we sought the Lord with earnest prayer, seeking for light. Do you think I could give up the light that God has given me? It is to be as the rock of ages. It has been guiding me ever since it was given. The reason why I've, I've brought up these four passages and, and briefly, very briefly dealt with this issue about the foundation and the, pit and the pillars is, is this. After 1844, after the great disappointment, God's people came together, the wise virgins, and they had to find out who and what they were. So they went back to the foundation, to the truths that were taught before 1844 in the Millerite movement, to establish whether or not they were true. And this, this checking, this establishing of this truth was, was done by the people who were involved in the message before 1844. And it was done over a certain time period. <clears throat> I'm just gonna pick up one or two portions from what we read in First Selected Messages. It says, for two or three years, my mind continued to be locked into an understanding of the scriptures. In the course of our labours, my husband and I visited Father Andrews. And she goes on. So she says that for two or three years, she had no comprehension of what the scriptures said. And this two or three years, in the context of this passage, is dealing with the time period that the brethren here are establishing the pins and the pillars of the foundation after 1844. In conjunction with that, and it's a very similar passage that's found in first selected messages, is found in first manuscript releases, 52.2. Here she says, and if you read, and as we read the word, you'll see it's very similar wording to what we find in first selected messages. I do not wish to ignore or to drop one link in the chain of evidence that was formed as after the passing of the time in 1844, little companies of seekers after truth met together to study the Bible and to ask God for light and guidance. The truth, point by point, was fastened in, my, in our minds so firmly that we could not doubt so what they do is, after the passing of time in 1844, little companies get together and they study after the truth. And point by point, and I'm suggesting they go point by point through all the truths that were, that were presented on the 1843 chart to establish whether or not they were true or not. And she says, and these truths were fastened in our minds so firmly that we could not doubt. The evidence given in our early experience has the same force that it had then. And when she says the same force, she's talking about present tense, and this passage was actually written in 1906, almost at the end, you know, at the end of her ministry now. The truth is the same as it ever was, as it ever has been, and not a pin or pillar can be moved from the structure of truth. That which was sought for out of the word in 1844, 1845 and 1846 remains the truth in every particular. So you can see here in first manuscript releases, she gives some years. And you can see she's dealing with a history, a time period of about three years, which is the same time period that Ellen White deals with in First Selected Messages, where she says her mind was locked for two or three years, where the brethren were studying out the pins and the pillars in establishing everything that was taught before 1844, whether or not it was true. And this is, a, there's another passage here in first manuscript releases again, and it's page 53.2. So it's first manuscript releases 53.2. Here she says, the truths given us after the passing of the time in 1844 are just as certain and unchangeable as when the Lord gave them to us in answer to our urgent prayers. The visions that the Lord has given me are so remarkable that we know 
that we have accepted, that what we have accepted is the truth. This was demonstrated by the Holy Spirit. Light, precious light from God, established the main points of our faith as we hold them today. So when you, and the, again, it's from, the, it's from 1906. When you put all this information together, <clears throat> what she's saying is that two or three years after 1844, the brethren who were, who, was given, who were given these truths that are on the 1843 chart got together and established or checked or conf and confirmed that the truths that were presented before 1844 were in fact true. And as, as we discussed very briefly yesterday, that they needed the help of the Holy Spirit and they needed the spirit of prophecy to guide them in the right direction. We read yesterday how that when they would come to portions of the scriptures that they couldn't understand after wrestling um, in prayer and in study, God would open up the scriptures to Ellen White, um, give her an explanation of what those passages mean and she would relate them and the brethren would understand what those scriptures were saying and they would move on. So, why am I bringing all this to your attention? There's a very familiar passage that is found in early writings, <coughs> page 74. It's one that most people, are, many people are familiar with and when it comes to the issue of the 2520, a number of people use this passage as evidence or leverage to show that the 2520 um, was a mistake. It, it w w was not um, a truth that was held after 1844 and that we should not be promoting today. Um, and the portion from early writing says, I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered, that the figures were as he wanted them, that his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed. <clears throat> now, there are people who are using this passage that's found in early writings 74 and they, they look at this passage and they, and they read it loosely and when they, when they look at this thing, uh, at the 1843 chart, one of the things that, uh, one of the logics that they use is to say, well, there, there's much information on this chart, many prophecies, and they'll look at the 2,300 day prophecy, um, the 1260, the 1290, the 1335, and of course, the 2520. <clears throat> And what they will tell you is that if you look throughout Ellen White's writings post, you know, after this time period, if you look at the writings of the pioneers, um, if you see what the church is talking, uh, the information that we present today, you can find all of these prophecies being discussed and spoken about except the 2520. There's hardly anything spoken about it. Ellen White never mentions it by name in her writings. Um, the church doesn't promote it. Um, during the later portion of our history, um, two leading figures at least in the, in the church, both James White and Uriah Smith, argue against the 2520 being a, a valid time prophecy. And, and they, they, they have a collection of... Um, these pieces of evidences and, and th they use this logic and, and, and use this statement from seven, uh, early writing 74 to say that the 2520, um, and, and they word it like this, is one of the mistakes on the 1843 chart and, and that's how they see it. The discussion sort of c can move on because most people who go to this depth, are familiar that there's another chart, the 1850 chart, 
<clears throat> and they're very well aware that the 2520 is presented on this chart, but it's not presented in the same way. It's, um, it's almost described in passing, and depending on who, on who the person is, they'll, they'll give some logic to that, to say you know, they just put it in as a footnote or for reference, but it really doesn't have any bearing to the message that we're required to give to the world after 1844. Essentially that it has no place in, in, the, in, the, in the message that we're required to understand and we're required to present. I just want to show simply why that, that cannot be so. Now we've already read uh, a, a number of passages um, which are, are based around this passage from First Selected Messages. That after 1844, the brethren go back and establish all the, all the truths that were presented before 1844. And we know that the 2520 time prophecy was certainly a part of the information of the truths that were presented uh, before 1844. And if you look at um, William Miller's writings, you'll know that in fact the 2520 was discovered or found by him before he actually found the 2300 days. Um, and it was, it's not the other way around. It was a major prophecy in his mind um, to explain what his understanding of the, what the great controversy was about. It was, the 2520 was really the theme, the overarching theme of how he would construct his, his presentations, his delivery, was, was based upon this idea of how God's people were punished and then they were to be restored um, right at the end of the world, as he understood it, 1844. Uh, and all the other time prophecies would, would sort of fit into this, into this overarching theme that he would, he would present. So we know that the 2520, from his perspective, was, was very important. In the few closing moments that we have, I just want to, we'll, 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 pick, we'll develop this point further in our, in our next presentation, but I just want to pick up one point here. Um, when, you read the, when you read the word, the wording in early writing 74, it definitely says a mistake in the singular. Um, tomorrow we'll, we'll go in and, and, I, and I'll try to establish more about what this singular mistake is. But I'll let you know now that when it says a mistake, it's in a singular. And if you compare the two charts, <clears throat> and it's recorded in, in a number of places, both in the writings of the pioneers and in Spirit of Prophecy, that the major mistake that was made on this chart was the fact that they... Um, I'll put it this way, they lost a year. The way they calculated the time prophecies, um, they lost a year in, in their calculations and they kept on ending up getting to the year 1843 instead of getting to 1844. And we know that this, th this mistake is found here both in the 2520 and the 1843, uh, sorry, the 2300 day prophecy. And I'm suggesting that this is the mistake that Ellen White is dealing with when she says that there was a mistake in the chart. <clears throat> if you look at the, the context of what she's talking about um, in early writings, page 74, it's, it's dealing with a number of issues but it centres around the issue of time, and, and that's what the point she's trying to make. When you come to the 1850 chart, you can see that this mistake has been corrected. For sure, there are other issues with the 1843 chart. There are other mistakes with it, but they're not the ones that Ellen White was dealing with. She was dealing with one specific issue, and for us to go in and to try to speculate what mistake she was referring to um, is both incorrect, is dangerous and incorrect because you can see quite clearly and 
in tomorrow's presentation, I'll, I'll try to show you that simply, that she was dealing specifically with this mistake of this missing year, this, lo this loss of time. So we'll close our presentation for today and we'll, we'll pick up this theme tomorrow, just trying to establish <clears throat> what the mistake was and what, what implications that has for the 2520 when you look at both charts and the work that was done after 1844. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to continue to be guided by your Holy Spirit. We know, Lord, that there is much in your word that we as surface readers, Lord, miss and cannot understand. Help us, Lord, not to shy away from your word, to spend time in it, to delve into the mysteries that have been hidden for generations, but which you are now desiring to open before your people. Father, may each of us be willing to spend and be spent for your cause. May we be desirous to serve you faithfully in all that we do and say. Guide our thoughts and our feelings as we go about our business this day. May all that you do and say for us, Lord, we know, Father, that it will be to our good. May we accept all these things as your will for our lives. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>